Tinakoto, Tinakoto, Tinakoto Kato. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I know many of you, but for those I don't know, I'm Professor Lynn Tribble of the University of Otago English Department, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our event tonight. Um, the, the, uh, ben Crystal has been brought uh, to us through the good offices of Shakespeare Globe New Zealand, um, and I've just been to the University of Otago Sheila Wynn Shakespeare Festival, which happens every Queen's Birthday weekend um, up in Wellington, and saw some really amazing Shakespeare works. I'm very energized by that. Uh, before I formally introduce Ben Crystal, I'd like just to um, welcome Don Sanders, the CEO of Shakespeare Globe New Zealand, who will speak very briefly to us. Thank you very much. Tenakotu, tenakotu, tenakotu katoa. How lovely to be here again with the University of Otago, who is our biggest and best sponsor. We're really thrilled to have this opportunity to bring Ben Crystal here. We have just had our 26th SGCNZ University of Otago Shilwin Shakespeare Festival, and it's just growing. It's, it's unbelievable with young people not having to do Shakespeare on the curriculum anymore, but just to have that enthusiasm and the creativity, the entrepreneurship, the innovation, which I believe are creating thinkers and leaders for tomorrow, the ones who can think outside the square and present somebody's work from 400 years ago in new, fresh ways and be creative in whatever capacity they end up as a profession. With having been out, I'd like to thank Julie Nevitt, who's a very well-known Wellington arts philanthropist, and also the British Council for assistance, and various other people who've contributed in different places in Christchurch, the Isaac Theatre Royal, here in Dunedin, the University of Otago, for which we're very grateful, and then in Auckland. So we are bringing, we brought Ben out to do some of his work in original pronunciation, known as OP, and he's worked with some of our students in a lab in Wellington and did a production at Circa, which was given in generosity by Circa Tact Organisation. So it's with much pleasure that I have been here. I met his parents, David and Hilary, in, 19, in 2006 in London and hosted them in Wellington when they were out and have followed them and been for several years since and have been and his partner Helen who both gave workshops at our festival and he's going to be, he's given other talks in other places and he's going to give you a treat tonight. So I'd like to welcome you Ben and hand over. Thank you very much. Um, ben is an author, an actor, and a producer of Shakespeare, a prolific author, author with his father, David Crystal, whom Don just mentioned. Um, he wrote Shakespeare's Words, 2002, and the Shakespeare Miscellany. Um, his first solo book, Shakespeare on Toast, um, Getting a Taste for the Bard, was published in 2008 and is, in fact, available at the University Bookshop. Um, and was shortlisted for the 2010 Educational Writer of the Year Award, other books include You Say Potato or Patata, a book about accents, and an illustrated dictionary of Shakespeare. So Ben has been a pioneer in the area of original practices, including original pronunciation. What did Shakespeare's plays sound like in the 1590s? But more widely, questions of what, what effect does the space have that Shakespeare um, performed in? Um, what, how did Shakespeare's company engage with the audience? Um, how did he work with his actors? How did his actors rehearse? So through a series of uh, workshops, educational events, and the like, and we just saw a great sample of that this morning, uh, this afternoon, when um, Ben talked to um, a couple of hundred secondary school students here and uh, really wowed them with Shakespeare. Um, so these things are not... Um, simply museum pieces. It's not about just kind of d delving into the past for the past sake. It's really a question of how you, that by reconstructing and beginning to understand how Shakespeare originally produced his work, his original practices, that we can re reconnect ourselves with Shakespeare and see him as he was in the original excitement that his plays produced in the globe um, in, the, in the 1590s. So please um, welcome me and 
uh, join me, rather, in welcoming Jen Crystal. Thank you. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of Invention. A kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling sin. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. But pardon, gentles, ah. The flat, unraised spirits that hath dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt? Oh, pardon. Since a crooked figure may attest in little place a million, let us ciphers to this great accompt on your imaginary forces work. Amen. So that was, what was that? That was a recreation of the sound system of 400 years ago. I've been playing around with both this original practice and other original practices for the last 10 years or so. Um, there's nothing quite like experiencing Shakespeare in its original context. And, and what I mean by that is, if you can, going to see Shakespeare in an original practice space. Shakespeare was not written for a proscenium arch theatre where you come and sit in the dark and the audience uh, relaxes uh, and doesn't participate and the actors are brightly lit and cannot see them or make contact with them. Some of the original practice spaces that there are in the world are the Shakespeare's Globe on the South Bank of the River Thames, the Blackfriars Theatre in Virginia, the Pop-Up Globe now as well, um, where they are exploring what the theatrical dynamic might have been like as close as they possibly can with some compromises. The Shakespeare's Globe on the south bank of the River Thames has a concrete floor and sprinklers because <laughs> they do learn some lessons. <laughs> but as, as close as they can possibly understand it. How does, not to be authentic, because who wants authenticity? You don't want to go to the globe and get the plague. <laughs> but what can we learn? When they produced uh, Twelfth Night at the Middle Temple uh, 14 years ago, uh, where Twelfth Night was, was first performed 400 years ago, they perforce performed the play in the Traverse, with audiences along either side and at one end. I don't know if you remember, at the end of Twelfth Night, uh, Viola comes on stage, still disguised as Cesario, and Toby and Agachi come on, protesting wildly that they've just been beaten up by this man who is standing suddenly in front of them. And then Sebastian runs on apologizing for having beaten them. And for the first time, you see the two twins on stage. It's quite difficult to stage in a proscenium arch theater. For the first time in the space that it was originally written for, the audience and the actors as one became part of a tennis match. And they all went, and a part of the play that's been so difficult to stage for the last 100, 150 years suddenly was easy in its original context. In the Sam Wanamaker Playhouse, the Candlelit Playhouse, we've been exploring what the late plays look like, those masked plays like The Tempest, 
What does Macbeth look like when we can turn out all the lights and have Lady Macbeth and Macbeth wandering around in candlelight? What does that do to the human eye? How does that change the way that we receive the plays? Shakespeare's audience was said to go and hear a play, not to go and see a play. Your eyes work differently by candlelight. It changes the way that we costume the characters by candlelight. The Globe have been exploring many different original practices. They've been exploring the original practice of space. They've explored the original practice of costume. How does it change the way an actor moves, whether it be male or female, when suddenly they're wearing block heels, a corset, and a skirt with many skirts that they mustn't trip over? How does that change the way you move around the stage? What does it do to an audience not to have electronic music amplified, but music played by 400-year-old instruments? How does that change the atmosphere? How does it change Romeo and Juliet to have Mercutio and Tybalt fighting in French and Italian styles? They mock each other for having different fighting styles. This was one of the fundamental questions that Sam Wanamaker asked when he was cajoling and fundraising and provoking people into creating the establishment that sits on the south bank of the River Thames now. About 10 years or so ago, the Shakespeare's Globe phoned up my father, the linguist, David Crystal, and said, is it possible, can we explore the original practice of accent? And he said, yes, yes, of course. People have actually been playing around with this idea for, for some years. Sir Peter Hall, one of the original architects of the Royal Shakespeare Company, architect by architect, I mean an artistic director, the, one of the guys that set it up. And it was a party trick of his to, uh, to be able to speak Shakespeare, an original pronunciation, as we call it now. But they were desperately worried, the Shakespeare's Globe. They were worried that it would be incomprehensible, that it would turn audiences away. They are and, and should be worried about appearing to try to be authentic, about being mistook for a museum piece or a Disney world where what is performed there is not thought-provoking, experimental or provocative, but staid and window shopping. And certainly nothing that ever should be in inaccessible, irrelevant, unable to capture the hearts and minds of the next potential generation of bard lovers. You say Shakespeare's accent to people and, well, what do they think they hear? What do they think they're going to hear? I know what they think they're going to hear because people come up to me and tell me. They think they're going to hear their high school teacher doing Chaucer. The non es preste stele. But Chaucer wrote in Middle English, Shakespeare in early modern English, just an earlier version of the way that we speak and write. You heard it earlier. Over the next 40 minutes or so, and I'll end with some time for some questions, I'll try and explain as much as I can to you of uh, both what it sounds like, we'll explore together what it might remind you of, what it does to the actors, who perform it, and what use is it, what we can learn from it. First of all, that sound. The sound of Shakespeare. When I was a young actor, when I was, went to drama school, I was told that if I wanted to speak Shakespeare, I'd have to speak Shakespeare in received pronunciation. Mm -hmm. Received pronunciation. Received pronunciation. <coughs> received pronunciation is the accent of the Queen. Although, you know, if you watch the Queen's address over the last 50 odd years, her accent has changed. Her accent, since the arrival of her grandchildren, is slipping towards the estuary every day. <laughs> so whatever received pronunciation is, it is the Queen's English, it is the accent that uh, the Scotsman who set up the BBC decided would be the clearest accent for radio. And it is the accent that I was told that if I wanted to speak Shakespeare, if I wanted to be paid to speak Shakespeare, paid to be an actor, sorry. <laughs> if I wanted to be paid to speak Shakespeare, I would have to speak it in received pronunciation. Now, the accent that I'm speaking, well, 
the accent that I'm speaking in. First of all, what is accent? Accent is the oral or the aural, depending on whether you're speaking or listening, fingerprint. It's your identity. It's territory. It's who you are. In 1950s Liverpool, when my dad grew up, accents wouldn't just change from village to village. They changed from street to street as a marker of identity and territory. And you get beaten up if you had the wrong accent. Your accent tells a listener more about who you are than the clothes that you wear, than the things that you like, than the things that you retweet. My accent, my identity, is called modified received pronunciation because this is received pronunciation and this is modified received pronunciation. And the difference, well, the difference is um, that whilst I was born in Ascot, which is just outside of London, uh, London sort of here and Ascot sort of here, um, well, uh, when I was seven years old, uh, I, I moved to North Wales and, uh, and so whenever I go home, it scares the hell out of my girlfriend because I start speaking more like that, you know. Um, I, I, I've got, uh, my natural accent has more Welsh in it. Yeah, I, I, I speak more like this when I go home. But uh, I, I, a lot of my Welsh left me because um, when uh, I was 18, I went to university in Lancaster. And in Lancashire, they speak with a short A in their voice. So um, I don't say, um, uh, I'm going to take a bath. Uh, I usually say, I'm going to take a bath. That's the short A. Um, and then, of course, uh, in the United Kingdom, if you want to be an actor, then you've got to go to London. That's where the acting um, is. And so uh, I've got a bit of Cockney in my voice. Uh, it's been a while since I've uh, been home, so my Cockney has sort of slipped more towards Dick Van Dyke. But, <laughs> but, uh, but I still tend to, more often than not, unless I'm thinking about it, I'll say uh, that uh, I'll talk about bottles rather than bottles. The glottal stop, the glottal stop, the flat T sound of Cockney. And then after uh, training, um, well, uh, you know, I've been really lucky with Shakespeare and he's taken me around the world. He's taken me to the United States a lot and I, I, I have got a, a transatlantic sort of quality to my voice. I talk about uh, boiling the kettle and taking the dog for a walk instead of boiling the kettle and taking the dog for a walk. So my accent is receive pronunciation with a bit of Welsh, bit of Lancaster, quite a lot of London, and a whole smorgasbord of Transatlantica. That's the sound that you hear me speaking in now. All of those sounds that compromise my voice, my life experiences to date, who I am, who I've been, the things that I felt, the places that I felt them in, should be flattened out if I want to perform this particular style, this particular work of art. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal lines, loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life whose misadventured, piteous overthrows doth, with their death, bury their parents' strife. <laughs> I mock the accent a little. But I get letters, letters, email, emails. I get direct messages still to this day from drama students in regional parts of the world, not just in the UK. The actors I was working with just last week in Wellington, people still to this day are being told, you cannot speak Shakespeare in your voice. You must speak this sound, this sound of the 2%. So I, I mock it, but I mock it with love. <laughs> Same speech. This recreation of Shakespeare's accent. What accents does it remind you of? What does it do to me? Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our sane. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. 
From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured, piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife. What accents does it remind you of? Common. Let's come back to that. That's a really good point. If I don't, remind me. Yes, sir. South country. Yep. A little bit Irish. Little bit Irish. Yokel. Yokel. <laughs> you know, whenever I, I, I go into, I try and go into schools about once a month. Um, because I hated Shakespeare when I was younger and I'm determined to try and wrest the education system into some sort of thing that doesn't indulge kids in hating Shakespeare so much by making them read it. Different, different talk, different talk. Stop it, Ben. <laughs> but I'll always give them a little bit of original pronunciation, even if it is off topic and they're never going to get examined on it. And I say to them, what accent does it remind you of? And they all go, Pirates of the Caribbean! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Johnny Depp. Although over here they go, Lord of the Rings, <laughs> Game of Thrones, <laughs> yokel. Uh, other accents? Yorkshire. Yorkshire, yep. The accent you don't want to say because you think you'll be wrong. Somerset. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. There's a theme. I get people say American. Yeah, Canadian. Canadian. <laughs> Australian. Mm. Yep. You're getting the theme. We know where Shakespeare's actors came from. There's an amazing scholar, a Kiwi scholar actually, called Andy Gurr. He's Kiwi, isn't he? Yeah. He wrote a wonderful book called Shakespeare's Company and he worked out where they all came from and they came from Norfolk and Suffolk. They came from Kent and Cornwall and Devon. They came from Ireland and Scotland. They came from the Midlands where that ar 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 yokel sound comes from. And they came to London and their accents all mixed together, just like our accents do, the linguistic trait of accommodation, where if I like you and you like me, our accents will move together, we'll be accent buddies. <laughs> and if I don't like you and you don't like me, then our accents will get stronger, territory, identity. So the same thing happened in Shakespeare's time. Their accents all melded together, and then the accents left London and went to Bristol and sailed to the Americas and of course later on they got sent to Bristol and sent down to Australia and that's partly where those accents come from. In one line of Shakespeare you can go around the world. Richard II at one point says, yet I will hammer it out, his Act 5 soliloquy. Yet, I will hammer it out. In original pronunciation, yet, I will hammer it out. I don't say yet, I say yet. You say yet. <laughs> I, I, listen to that sound, listen to that pronoun. I, 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 it's up here, it's up here. I, 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 I. I, the personal pronoun, switches. It goes back in the mouth, the vowel sound, and further down. That has a knock-on effect, which drops your pitch. Your center shifts to your diaphragm, much more useful when you are uh, projecting in an outdoor space, a bit like the globe. It makes me shift my stance. Oi, oi. Sort of somerset -y sort of way. Will. Will's kind of the same, but it's got a slightly darker quality to the L. Hammer. Er. Er. That strong R sound, the rhotic R. America. 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 It. It is it. <laughs> oot. Oot is Canadian. Yit, or you will hammer it oot. In half a line of Shakespeare, not even a full metrical line, you go around the globe. Two households, both alike in dignity and fair Verona, where we lay our scene. I remember going to see Shakespeare and the style of the 20th century to declaim 
I remember going up to my father in the interval and saying, Dad, I love this, but why aren't they moving? <laughs> and I remember going to see great physical theatre companies and watching them move beautifully, but not having great voices. And I wanted to find a way to fuse the two. I wanted to find more accessible, accessible, more dynamic, more physical, more active, more passionate Shakespeare. Not just to see, but to produce. Not just to produce, but to act in. I wasn't interested in original pronunciation until this first proper experiment at the Globe. Like I say, they were worried that no one would understand it. My father said, well, you know, if you don't do it, Stratford-upon-Avon will. <laughs> You've never seen a production greenlit faster. <laughs> but they were still nervous. They did Romeo and Juliet. They performed it in received pronunciation for the most part, but they did three performances in the middle of the run in original pronunciation but they had to re-rehearse the play. These changes in pitch, these changes in stance, these changes in movement. The master of movement came and sat down, watching the actors stumble their way through this new sound and how it was affecting them and the discoveries they were making. And she whispered to my father, she said, my goodness, the actors are moving differently. Accent can make you move differently. That's when I started exploring this myself. I knew um, that accents could bring different qualities, but the qualities that we're used to are posh accent for nobility, yokel comedy accent for common. How do you do Midsummer Night's Dream? Well, the, fair, the king of the fairies and the duke, they speak with a posh accent. The mechanicals, oh, they just speak like that and the work is done, right? You don't even have to do any acting. You can just do silly voices. We have become lazy with our Shakespeare. The single biggest hurdle, the barrier to us thinking our way into the Elizabethan mindset is this idea that we can divine educational or economic or even intelligence background from the sound of someone's voice. This made no sense in Shakespeare's time. Sir so Walter Raleigh was at the top of the court and he spoke with a Devonshire accent to his dying day. People did change their accents, of course they did. When King James came to the throne, funnily enough, everyone started speaking with a bit of a Scottish twang. We've been, we've been exploring original pronunciation a fair bit around the world now. And these changes that I'm illustrating for you, this shift in stance, this shift in uh, centre, the shift in pitch, it occurs in both boys and girls. And that's interesting. I like the fact that it provokes, that an original practice, as close as we can possibly get, provokes a different style. What can we learn? And how close can we get? Well, we can get about 90% right, which isn't bad. We get 90% right three ways. The first are the rhymes. That's one of the ways we know what OP sounds like. 154 sonnets all end with a rhyming couplet. Two thirds of those sonnets don't rhyme in, in received pronunciation. There are the rhyming plays like Midsummer Night's Dream and Richard II and the long poems. All these rhymes, they're one source of data. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. Either Shakespeare was a really bad poet, or the accents changed. So it had to have been, if this be error and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. Or, if this be error and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man eluved. <laughs> and we know, we absolutely know, that the only person to have elongated that vowel of love to love, 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 was Elvis. <laughs> it's a terrible joke. <laughs> it's true, though. 
the rhymes. Mercutio's Queen Mab speech. You go back to the original practice of text. We don't have any original scripts of Shakespeare, but we have the first folio, edited by two of his actors at a time when they used to spell a lot more like they used to speak. Mercutio's Queen Mab speech, he talks about Mab flying through people's minds, whipping a, a, a dragonfly or something she's, she's riding, and she has a whip and the, the whip has a handle and a lash of film. And that word film is spelled P-H-I-L-O-M-E. Film, or possibly filame. Probably film, because if you go to Ireland and you get invited, do you want, would you like, after, after this, do you want to come and see the new Guardians of the Galaxy film? I'd like to go and see the Wonder Woman film. Would you like to come with? I mean, that's an Elizabethan pronunciation that stayed with us for 400 years. Film. So the spellings of the second, and then the third source of data, there were linguists at the time that wrote books on what the accent sounded like. Now, of course, history is written by the historians, so it has to be taken with a pinch of salt, as does all of this. But uh, Ben Johnson, one of Shakespeare's contemporaries, wrote uh, a pronouncing dictionary. And he goes through the letters of the alphabet, and he says how he pronounces them. And when he gets to the letter R, he says, we pronounce this sound. Thank you, Ben. Awesome. Go write better plays. Ooh. Come on. Um, he calls it the cananis literatus, the doggy sound. Think, rrr. possibly a uvular trill, rrr. possibly an alveolar trill. Rrr. Oh, can we do it in Welsh? Probably less intrusive, just an rrr sound. All of that takes you to the spellings, the rhymes, the accounts of the time. It takes you to about 90% right. That 10%, that last 10%, it drives my dad crazy because he wants it to be perfect. I'm really pleased, because in our explorations, what happens is, well, if, if we were all to learn original pronunciation together, we'd all be 90% the same. But the last 10%, well, the last 10% I fill with my identity, my accent, my mongrel sound of, 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 of received pronunciation and, and Welsh and Lancaster and, and London and Transatlantica. And your original pronunciation would be 90% the same as me and 10% you. And yours would be 90% the same as me and 10% you and so on and so forth. And we would now have an acting company who speak Shakespeare in a, a sound that is together and still unique, still individual. Rather than we form a company, we flatten out our regional sounds, we all sound the same as the 2%. When the younglings came to hear Shakespeare and OP at the Globe, we, had, we said, what do, you, what do you think? What does it sound like? Yeah, it's great, it's great. Well, what do you mean it's great? Oh, they sound like us. Now, of course it doesn't sound like them. But what they meant was it doesn't sound like them. It doesn't sound like the elite anymore. I like the fact that this sound gives ownership for the actors. It gives a familiarity to the audience, because despite the fact that I'm speaking a sound that was centralized and localized in Elizabethan London, you already speak a bit of it. You all say yit. You're already pretty good at original pronunciation. <laughs> ownership and familiarity. Two things that are missing for the so much when people think about Shakespeare and why people keep asking, is Shakespeare still relevant? How do we make it accessible? Should we translate it? Do I think that people should always speak in original pronunciation? No, 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 of course not. I hope original pronunciation might be the bridge back to a place where the right accent to speak Shakespeare in is your accent, because you want to speak Shakespeare. And if you've got it in your heart, it doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter what accent you speak it in. Your accent is right. It does help if the rhymes work as well. <laughs> there are also puns to be discovered. Rhymes that work. Oh, that's lovely when rhymes work in Shakespeare. He must have wanted them, his, his rhymes to to rhyme. There were no such thing as I rhymes. It wasn't just a page rhyme. People, half the plays weren't even printed in his lifetime. 
There's a great pun in As You Like It. In As You Like It, which is essentially a good duke, bad duke, good duke banished, runs off to a forest with his merry men. One of them isn't so merry, the melancholy Jakes. The melancholy Jakes comes back from having seen a clown in a forest and he's laughing and the Duke says, Jakes, why are you laughing? And Jake says, a fool, a fool, I met a fool this forest. As I do live by food, I met a fool who laid him down and basked him in the sun and railed on Lady Fortune in good terms, in good set terms, and yet a motley fool. Good morrow, fool, quoth I. No, sir, quoth he, call me not fool till heaven has sent me fortune. And then he drew a dial from his poke, and looking on it with lackluster rice, says very wisely, it is ten o'clock. Thus we may see, quoth he, how the world wags. Tis but an hour ago since it was nine, and after one hour more, twill be eleven. And so from hour to hour we ripe and ripe, and from hour to hour we rot and rot, and thereby hangs a tale. When I did hear the motley fool thus moral on the time, my lungs began to crow like Chanticleer, that fools should be so deep contemplative, and I did laugh, sons intermission, an hour by his dial. <laughs> it's not funny. Then he drew a dial from his poker and looking on it with lackluster eyes, says very wisely, it is ten o'clock. Those who may see, quoth he, how the world wags. Tis but an hour ago since it was nine. After one hour more, twill be eleven. And so from hour to hour we ripe and ripe, and from hour to hour we rot and rot, and thereby hangs a tale. That's the joke. When I did hear the motley fool thus moral on the time, my lungs began to crow like Chanticleer. Talking of Chaucer, Chanticleer was the cockerel in the nun's priest's tale, the nonna's priest's tale. Eh? Cockerel with the most beautiful ar, 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 in all the land. That's the noise this melancholy fellow made. And I did laugh, he says, son's intermission, an hour by his dial. He laughed for an hour without a break. Why? It's not funny. We looked at it in OP. In original pronunciation, the word hour is pronounced or. Or, say it with me, or. Yeah, it feels good, doesn't it? In original pronunciation, the word prostitute, whore, is pronounced or. Our, or, whore, or. A full, a full, I met a full in forest. As I do live by foot, I met a full who laid him down and basked him in the sun and railed on Lady Fortune in good terms, in good set terms, and yet a motley full. Good morrow, full, quoth I, no sir, quoth he, call me that full till heaven has sent me fortune. And then he drew a doyle from his pork, and looking on it with lackluster rice, says very wisely, It is ten o'clock. Thus we may say, quoth her, how the world wags. Tis but an hour ago since it were nine. And after own or more, twill be a len. <laughs> and so from or to or we ripe and ripe. And then from or to or we rot and rot. <laughs> and thereby hangs a tale. <laughs> it's a really rude sex joke. <laughs> Shakespeare's full of them. We put sex jokes all over Shakespeare these days because we can't make him funny. He was making them before we even came up with them that we insert in them. <laughs> the last time I saw this play, the actor came out and went, and so from hour to hour we ripe and ripe and from hour to hour we rot and rot and thereby hangs a tale. Anyway, I'll... <laughs> There's a pun, I said the pun in, in, in two households, both alike in dignity earlier. I got it wrong. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, the line goes. And I said lines, because the words were pronounced the same in OP. From forth the fatal loins. It is loins of the families, but it is also lines of the families. I love the fact that in original pronunciation, there's more color to the word. Colour is when you make a word sound like it's supposed to. Like making the word majesty sound like majesty. And the word dustbin sound like a dustbin. You could make the word majesty sound like dustbin, 
majesty if you wanted to, but giving a word colour makes Shakespeare come alive. Cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. <laughs> war. Hello. <laughs> I'm a dog of war. <laughs> I'm pleased to meet you. <laughs> We're going to have some war now. <laughs> and then tea. <laughs> Cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. Say it with me. War! Doesn't it feel awesome? And doesn't it sound like the thing it's supposed to sound like? I got to play Hamlet a few years ago. To be or not to be. A speech that has been talked about and confused about and argued about for hundreds of years. What does it mean? Most people think it's Hamlet talking about suicide, but Hamlet talks about suicide early in the play. He says, oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw and resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh God, oh God. And then he sees the ghost of his father and he gets put on this mission. and gives himself a hard time in, oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Gives himself a hard time for not having done anything yet. He thinks the audience, and calling him a coward, that's what those speeches were there for. It was an opportunity for the protagonist to come to the audience, his friend, that he could see in a shared light in a theatre like the Globe and say, do you think I'm a, am I a coward? Oh God, you're probably right. I haven't done anything yet. The play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. I'll put a play on. That all sorted out. <laughs> And he comes back on stage a few minutes later and says, to be or not to be? That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing anthem. What's it about? I've seen a production where the actor comes out on stage with a bottle of water and a bottle of pills because he talks about making his own kiatus with a bare bodkin, cutting his wrist with a, with a, a simple knife, rather than enduring the pain of the world. But he's just decided what he's going to do. He's going to put on a play. They've moved the speech backwards. Peter Brook moved the speech to earlier in the play because it didn't make sense. You know, it's a sad truth that where suicides don't tell their best friend that they're going to commit suicide. And if you're my best friend, why am I coming to you to the, with this speech? What's the problem I want to solve? If you're going to play Hamlet, work out why you're going to say to be or not to be. That's, that's what my, was my approach. Why does he say it? And from that, I might be able to work out the rest of the play. I was looking, I was doing it in original pronunciation, and I was uh, using the first folio as well. Now, they hadn't standardized spelling. They certainly hadn't standardized publishing or printing. And in modern editions, a lot of random, seemingly random capital letters are edited out of Shakespeare's texts. But those capital letters, I was taught, are clues from Shakespeare, or clues from his actors. This is an important word. And when Hamlet asks in the first folio if he is a coward, it's capitalized, that C. And in original pronunciation, you pronounce the word coward Cord. Cord. It struck a chord. I'd seen that word somewhere else. Thus, conscience doth make cowards of us all. Capitalized in to be or not to be too. Suddenly I thought, hang on, hang on. What if he hears the audience? Am I a coward? Who calls me villain? Breaks my pate across, plucks off my beard and blows it in my face, gives them a lie at the throat as deep as to the lungs, huh? When Mark Rylance performed this at the, at the Globe, he waited. He said, huh? And waited until someone went, yeah. 
because the next thing Hamlet says is, swoons, I should take it, for it cannot be, but I am pigeon-livered, and lack gold to make oppression bitter, or ere this I should have fatted all the region kites with this slave's awful, bloody, abortive villain, and so on and so forth. And he tries to explain himself at the end. He says, the spirit that I have seen may be the devil. Hamlet went to Wittenberg to study. He studied philosophy with, Hor with uh, Horatio. He doesn't necessarily believe in heaven and hell, but he knows that the spirit that he's seen may be his father, it may be the walking corpse of his dead father, or it could be the devil sent in disguise to tempt them to evil. or it could be nothing. Either way, if he kills Claudius, and Claudius is innocent, then whether or not he believes in heaven or hell, he has to admit that that's a possibility. And actually, what would you do in my position? Would you kill him? Would you kill him? Would you kill him? Do you believe in life after death? Do you? Do you know that there's something after this? We might have faith, but this is a question we still haven't answered. And if you thought about life and death the way that I think about life and death, you would be a coward too. So, have patience with me. I'm coming to it. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by a poison end them. To die, to sleep no more, and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life, for who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, the poor man's contumely, the pangs of disprised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns the patient merit of the unworthy takes, when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin. Who would these faddles bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life? but that the threat of something after death, the undiscovered country, from whose born no traveller returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience doth make cords of us all. And thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought and enterprises of great pith and moment. With this regard, the currents turn awry and loose the name of axion. Soft, you know, the fair of failure. It's been fascinating to explore it. It's been fascinating to share Shakespeare with people in this accent because it seems to release something else. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines by chance, or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. I remember hearing my drama school principal jumping up on Shakespeare Day and performing that in an RP. 
No idea what it means. <laughs> what a nice thing to do, hey? Do you like to be compared to a summer's day? It's nice, right? It's kind of like, oh. <laughs> You ever been to Britain? <laughs> like, I grew up in Wales, which is essentially Britain. This is a summer day for me. <laughs> Summer's not that nice. It's either too hot, and we complain about it, or it doesn't last very long, or we, you know, we get out there in suntan lotion and everything, and then it starts raining, or if you have a picnic, there are ants and wasps everywhere. And actually, you know, we were just in Japan before we came here, and they celebrate spring with this, the, the arrival of the cherry blossom. And it's beautiful because there's nothing, like the Japanese are so happy when the sakura comes, the cherry blossom comes. And it is beautiful, but it fades. Everything in nature fades. You're beautiful. You're all beautiful. You'll fade. <laughs> we all do. We'll all die. Everything in nature does. You won't. You're not even going to die. When you grow old and you get all wrinkly, you're never going to die. Death, the character, the actual living embodiment of death, like Terry Pratchett's death, is never going to be able to brag about claiming your soul and sweeping it under his cloak. What are you talking about, Shakespeare? That's impossible. Of course, we're all going to die. Nah. No, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write your beauty into this poem and I'm going to write my love for you into this poem. And in 400 years' time, a ginger actor <laughs> is going to be standing in a lecture theatre in Dunedin and talking about how beautiful you were and how much I loved you. And so you'll live forever, because this poem's going to live forever, because I'm that good. <laughs> Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough wines do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lace hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines, perchance, or nature's changing course untrimmed. Thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can say, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Thank you. We got like five minutes for some yeah. questions. Right? <laughs> um, there are some recordings. Uh, we did a, a, a full CD for the British Library in many different voices of eight, many different ages. Um, just this last year, my father published the Shakespeare's Original Pronunciation Dictionary, and you can look up any word in Shakespeare, and if you have even the barest, uh, and in fact the book teaches you how to read it, but the, an understanding of the International Phonetic Alphabet, then you can work out how, how to pronounce it. Um, do have confidence in the fact that you, you naturally already speak about a third to a, uh, half of the sounds. Uh, whenever we explore original pronunciation, Half the work is on my shoulders having to pick up original pronunciation and half the work is already done by the actors wherever they are in the world if they're speaking um, English. Uh, and, and then the third way is uh, once you start uh, having a go at it and, and you feel like you'd, you'd like to move on, then uh, send me a recording and um, we'll have a Skype session. Yeah, you'll be welcome.
Ironically, not in the United Kingdom. Um, I talked about ownership earlier. Um, when I've gone to the United States um, and to Australia and India and, and here, um, y there's a relief that we don't have to speak Shakespeare in this sound, right? Um, but in the United Kingdom, there's still a great desire to hear Shakespeare and receive pronunciation. There are very few companies that speak Shakespeare in a regional accent. Um, and until recently, they were looked down upon for doing, down upon for doing it. <laughs> Um, there have been 13 productions of Shakespeare in original pronunciation. There are 26 plays left, 26 new entire works that haven't been heard for 400 years with puns and rhymes to be discovered, new things to be discovered about Shakespeare rather than just rewriting another biography of him. Um, there are uh, there's a treasure trove waiting to be done um, and most of the productions have been in the States. Um, as of last week, there may well be a production coming to these shores. Uh, the, uh, the lab that we did with the, the Kiwi actors and the Maori actors provoked a great deal of interest in Wellington. Um, so there is some talk of some support, um, in which case I very much hope that uh, if a production raises, uh, we might be able to uh, take it around as well, maybe bring it down here, if we have good fortune. How did the audience respond? How did the actors cope? Two, uh, two lovely stories of that. Um, the first is that uh, when Romeo and Juliet meet, they share a sonnet. Um, and uh, at a dance and the director beautifully, wonderfully had them share the sonnet um, and, 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 and speak to each other and dance with each other and when they finished the sonnet they finished dancing. Now you might have noticed um, we don't have an awful lot of clues about the, the prosody of Shakespeare's original pronunciation, what it, how fast they would have spoken or the music of it. But we do have Hamlet speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trepidantly on the tongue. But do not mouth it, as many of our players do, for then I just leave the town cry, I spoke my lines. Do not mouth it, but speak it trippingly. And the folio as well, there's a lot of elisions, there's a lot of O apostrophe, TH apostrophe. It seems to be a speech that was supposed to be spoken with alacrity. Um, so, it was not, oh, it is my lady, oh, it is my love, oh, that she knew she were. It was, oh, it is my lady, oh, it is my love, oh, that she knew she were. So when Romeo and Juliet shared their sonnet, they finished speaking their sonnet in OP, but they still had a minute and a half of dancing left with nothing to say to each other. <laughs> Um, the original pronunciation production was 10 minutes faster than the RP. Two hours traffic. Um, they coped. You have to cope. Um, the other is that in rehearsal, uh, this idea of common, of yokel, of social status came up. And uh, the actor playing the prince, I think, came to the director and said, look, how am I supposed to show that I'm noble and all these fellows are common if we're all speaking the same bloody accent? <laughs> and the director said, act. <laughs> how do we show that someone is noble or kingly or, uh, or of, of uh, royalty? Give them a crown, that helps. And uh, when they enter, uh, everyone else kneels. Royalty isn't taken, it's imbued. Status isn't really taken as well as it is given, I suppose, by those around you. So, um, but I, again, back to that idea of the storytelling, it, it, it's back on the actor's shoulders rather than funny voices, I suppose. But um, uh, the, so the actor's nearly caused a mutiny as well, because at the end of the three days of, of OP, all but one wanted to complete, carry on performing in it. And um, there were stories of Juliet finding herself more grounded, of the nurse finding herself more grounded, of both of them being far more able to fight uh, verbally 
uh, their, uh, the, Juliet's father. And they tried to carry those discoveries back into RP, but it lifted them back off it. So um, they coped. But, um, uh, and yes, the audiences generally, uh, I, I believe, you know, there are some people that come and I don't want to understand it, so I won't. Which is fair enough, you know, people do like to hear Shakespeare in a particular way. And for the record, you know, I'm a big fan of Laurence Olivier and John Gielgud and Maggie Smith and Judi Dent. They are superlative Shakespeare performers. Shakespeare in RP is not something I'm fighting against. I'm fighting against the idea that Shakespeare should be spoken in a or any particular way. Like I said earlier, your voice is the right voice for Shakespeare. Um, their voice was the right voice for Shakespeare, even if some of them had regional accents, uh, originally like uh, Surya McKellen. Um, but uh, uh, the audiences generally come and f say, oh, it sounds familiar. Oh, they speak a bit like that where I come from. Because, of course, technically, OP is the great, 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 great grandmother of this sound. Absolutely, yes. It's the way that I used to uh, rehearse my audition speeches. I'd be, I'd be, I, when I, <laughs> I got an audition for the Globe, and um, I'd go to a, a park not far away from me uh, in London, and I'd be like, oh, oh. not while well, this is before I learned OP, I was using my Welsh. And I do the same with OP now. Oh, your renowned Lucius from our troops, I strayed to gaze upon a ruinous monastery. And as I earnestly did fix mine eye upon the wasted building, suddenly I heard a child cry underneath a wall. And I went to the, the audition and, renowned Lucius from our troops, I strayed to gaze upon a was like, And the director said, where are you from? <laughs> And I said, oh, I'm from Wales, actually. And she said, can you speak in a Welsh accent? And I said, yeah. And I, I was using it to help me find my way into it. And she said, can you do it now? And I performed the speech in my Welsh accent. And she said, yeah, you've got the job. If you speak it in your Welsh accent. And I did every day for six months on the Globe stage. Um, we found that speaking in OP certainly reveals a lot. It um, gives people access to these rhymes and to these puns. And then if we weren't using RP and we weren't using OP, then I would certainly f try to find some kind of marriage, some negotiation point between the actor's natural accent and, and these discoveries. So um, I worked with an actor once who, uh, who would, I, I thought he was from, he, he spoke with RP. And, um, uh, and he was actually from Scotland. He's got a beautiful Scottish voice. It's gorgeous. And he's got a great RP too. And I asked him to speak a speech he'd learned of Lennox in Macbeth. And, uh, and he started sort of speaking it in RP. And I said, no, 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 Johnny, Johnny, no, no, speak it in your Scots voice. And he said, you what? I said, speak it in your Scots voice. And he did. And at the end of it, he broke down and cried a little bit. And he's a big boy. And so I was like, Johnny, what's the matter? That was beautiful. And he said, I've never spoken it in my voice before. Now, your voice is the right voice, but we do have to have the rhymes. Do we have to have the rhymes? You don't have to have anything. It's nice if it rhymes. Anything that can add to the pile, whatever the root, if it helps Shakespeare make a little more sense, if it helps make it a little more accessible, if it helps the actor find a little more emotional or, uh, or, or just active or physical ownership over it, whatever the root, let's keep him alive, let's keep him accessible, let's keep him relevant. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.